Thank you so much, by the way. We really appreciate you coming. Um, so, I usually like to start these by talking about the beginning. Like, tell us how you got started in your career. And I actually saw that you, you worked for Center in the beginning. So, I'm, you, you've done a lot of different things, and I kind of want to get the beginning of how you got to where you are. I have the classic background for an entrepreneur, which is that I have no background whatsoever in anything that I'm doing. Uh, so I've had multiple careers, uh, and a lot of this starts back familiarly. I'm actually a multi-generational entrepreneur. Um, my grandparents uh, came, actually were born in the U.S. probably third generation, uh, but my grandfather and great uncle uh, had a laundry uh, route, a horse and, a horse and cart on the Lower East Side. They founded a company called Brooklyn Better Bleach. My great uncle founded a construction company, one of the bigger real estate companies in New York. Um, so that's two generations back. And then uh, my father went to family business, uh, and he's an entrepreneur. Um, I, I'd like to say that uh, during the dot com boom, um, I was a finalist for the Ian Wyatt Entrepreneur of the Year Award in New York um, about, uh, about eight or nine years ago. So my father won it four years ago. Now, you know. <coughs> That's, that's a little tacky. You know, you're, you're like, you know, late 70s and you're winning you know, New York City Year Award. Um, what are you winning for? Get out of the way of real estate. Um, so uh, it's a family firm. Is that real estate? Yes. So I come from an entrepreneurial real estate family. So my, my uh, early, um, actually, my very first entrepreneurial effort, um, the company I started when I was about 10 years old, was Rose Productions, which was a multimedia organization. Like, I have my business cards from the 1960s, late 60s, early 70s, a multimedia organization. Before multimedia had a very different connotation around here. Uh, and my younger brother was a magician. He would do um, magic shows and parties for school kids and so on. And uh, I figured that he needed you know, appropriate uh, marketing material, marketing communication stuff, like headshots and playbills and you know, posters and so on. And so uh, I you know, produced all of his uh, marketing collateral. And after about two years, he realized that the sum total of his income was about the sum total of my income, and there was a slight problem with this pass-through of his revenues to his supplier. So I lost my first client. But I, but I actually, at that point, had the, the sum back. Um, and then when I was uh, off in, in college, um, in, in high school, I realized that although I, I enjoyed science, I was a very overly diligent science student, but I could often get another half grade on my reports by having a very nice looking report cover. So I started doing graphic design for my report covers, and then I got to college and realized that the college I was at had a, uh, a letterpress print shop. So uh, I started working on letterpress, and then uh, eventually took over the letterpress print shop and turned it into, uh, I had 75 apprentices um, that we taught, and we did so all kinds of interesting business. Um, and then at school when I was in college, that, that was back in the day, we still had fireplaces, real fireplaces in, in rooms, uh, and so I figured that you needed wood for these fireplaces. So I would buy wood uh, wholesale by the court and then sell it retail to my, to my dorm mates um, and stuff. Uh, and so I was very entrepreneurial. So I actually got that profile in a college magazine back in 1970 as an entrepreneur group, whatever that kind of strange thing was. Uh, now we all take for granted this entrepreneurial stuff, but it was a, a relatively unusual thing from, uh, from way back then. Uh, and then uh, I went to a uh, college that had a, a thing called bladder ball. And I don't know if you've probably ever heard of bladder ball. Um, in, in New Haven, there was this tradition where once a year, they would bring out this giant canvas of a weightable ball uh, back then, you know, eight feet diameter, drop it in the middle of the old campus, and then each of the college, residential colleges would try and get it back to their own college. And uh, the problem was this was lubricated by a lot of, a lot of um, spirits, as it were. People started drinking through the like, Bloody Marys at you know, 7 o'clock in the morning. So by the time this thing was released at like 11 o'clock, everybody was totally sloshed, and you ended up having you know, something like 3,000 people running around the Haven trying to hit this giant ball back to their, their thing. So I figured that wasn't a very effective way to get out there and, and get in the middle of this melee. So um, what do you do? Well, I'm going to attack from the company. Um, I formed the ball, the Pearson Bladder Ball Attack and Lifting League. <laughs> and I sold shares and it's coming to my classmates with raised enough money to hire a helicopter. Um, and, then I, and, then, and I was running the, the, the press, the Pearson Press, so I figured we need a propaganda literature, so we could print up all these propaganda pieces um, saying, Pearson has one level. Nobody's ever won one level. 
because of course it's the box of this, this zoo. Um, so we printed up several thousand of these things, and then I actually convinced the master of the college uh, to uh, come up with this helicopter, and so we actually flew over to Haven in a helicopter, um, dropping these leaflets on the, on the entire um, I'm so glad we're recording this. <laughs> that was uh, great. Well, well but, but then of course, you know, Perception is all, right? And so that's why we're all big on marketing and personal branding and so on and so forth. So since nobody had ever really won black, well, how do you get somebody to actually win black? Well, well, it only really happens if it's recorded in the public, right? So what I did was, this was back in the day before there were video cameras. So I had a film camera. So I took a film camera up in a helicopter and actually filmed the aerial shots of the entire battle thing. And as soon as the helicopter landed, I raced over to Channel 8 television in New Haven and gave them the, 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 the footage as a stringer, along with, of course, the entire script for the story, saying for the first time the college is actually one letter ball, and they aired the new story with the aerial footage and the, the official, you know, <coughs> so we, we actually won. But anyway, since I was doing that um, early in the college, let me, let me ask you a question, just based on that story. I know, actually. <laughs> you, so, I, I was having a conversation with someone recently who kind of thinks that entrepreneurial, uh, being an entrepreneur is in your DNA. And so, you, do you think it's something you learn, or do you think it's something you are? Just based on some of these stories that you're this, this is one of the great sort of chicken and egg questions, or, or you know, nature versus nurture um, relative to anything in, in how people, people's characters or interests are born. Uh, I think there is, <clears throat> no question that there is some entrepreneurial something, whether it's genetic, whether it's psychological, whether it's psychiatric. Um, there, there's a, a wonderful book, if you uh, haven't read it, it's called The Hypomanic Edge, How a Little Bit of Craziness Equates to a Lot of Success. It's by a guy named John Gardner, uh, who was a, <clears throat> who is a professor at Hopkins. And he was doing his uh, graduate thesis on the interface of religion and psychiatry. You know, so Joan of Arc, which, did she hear God or was she just schizophrenic? That, that kind of thing. He was looking for various groups of people who seemed to share certain psychiatric um, similarities. Uh, and that was when, during the dot-com boom, he saw a, you know, a new big cover of the Bill Gross on the cover, and his headline said, this man just lost $8 billion, why is he smiling? So if you think of this movie, the, the, the you know, entrepreneurs were a little unusual, so he went to the uh, you know, psychiatric diagnostic manual to try and figure out, you know, was there anything that uh, might account for, for this kind of reaction? And he came up with a potential diagnosis. And, um, he, he sent around a, a, a little sample survey to some of the biggest entrepreneurs he knew, Bill Craig, Ben Green, and, uh, you know, Steve Jobs, and a few others. And he, he listed, you know, 17 characteristics and said, you know, just out of curiosity, um, do, do any of these ring a bell? You go, do any of these, you know, seem appropriate? And there were things like, you know, you know talks very fast, full of ideas, passionate, doesn't sleep a lot, um, you know, charismatic, takes too much risk, you know, sexually promiscuous, um, uh, you know, and spends too much money, um, you know, thinks they're going to conquer the world, um, you know, doesn't suffer fools gladly, you know, things like, like that. So these uh, are just what you look for. And, well, and, 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 and he got back, and he, was, he was expecting, um, you know, responses in the psychiatric stuff to come in like one standard deviation, and beyond that, it gets to be interesting. The responses he got back on a scale of one to five were like, you know, five, five, seven, yes, this is me, you know, 100% of these things. And so he said, well, maybe he has something there. And he looked at the back of the manual, and, and the, the condition of which these were all the symptoms is something called hypomania. And hypomania, if you're often familiar with um, you know, bipolar disorder or you know, manic depression, the you know, mania is the manic part of, of bipolar, it's the topic. And, um, and hypomania um, means less than manic. Hypo is, is hypo, is more, hypo is less than. And so, you know what the diagnostic differentiation is between mania, which is a, you know, a psychiatric disorder where you get locked up and, and you have real problems, and hypomania? It turns out that they have exactly the same diagnosis, except hypomanics are functional. <clears throat> so, uh, this whole book you wrote you know, goes through analyzing all of these uh, entrepreneurs, and it turns out that a very large percentage of them are hypomanic. So if you take, um, you know, uh, Gartner's approach that this is a psychiatric issue, uh, he estimates this, that roughly, you know, 10%, up to 10% of the world is, is hypomanic. And that's probably, in people's experience, seems to be, you know, somewhere between 1% and 10% of the world are naturally entrepreneurial. Um, now, there are certainly entrepreneurs by circumstance, if you have to feed your family, and the only way you can do it is to, you know, buy a widget for two and sell it for three, you'll do that. But people who, who get off on it, like many of the people in this room, um, that's, a, I think, a relatively small, whether it's genetic or psychiatric, it's a small number. That being said, 
Um, when I teach entrepreneurship, I, I run the uh, finance and entrepreneurship and economics program at Singularity University, uh, Silicon Valley, which is a fascinating uh, operation. Um, and in a lecture on entrepreneurship there, what I'd like to say is that the purpose of entrepreneurship programs is to move people along the spectrum. Because there is a whole spectrum from people who are crazy, you know, Larry, you know, what else, and Richard Branson, you know, Luth and Mark Cuban, you know, nut nutty entrepreneurs on the one hand. And there are people who, I'm sure we all know, who would never in a gazillion billion years consider working for themselves, creating, you know, starting a company. For them, it's like, it's like pulling their fingernails out by the roots, right? And so on that spectrum, what entrepreneurship programs can do, and entrepreneurship books and videos and blogs and, and centers like General Assembly can do, is to help move people along the spectrum. So that if you're totally paranoid about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs and you don't even want to touch them to get cooties in it, you know, this understanding how they work, why they work, what the startup process is, can help you maybe work for a startup or at least not spit on the next entrepreneurs. Right? And, and, and if, you, if you're somebody who's sort of in the middle, you know, and you're, you're not quite sure, they can help you to the next level and say, well, maybe I could start a company or maybe I'll go work in the real estate. And if you're somebody who's at the far end as a natural entrepreneur, it can give you the tools to be really spectacular. Let's just survey the room for a second. How many people are founders in this room? Wow. How many people are looking for money? <laughs> and how many people are looking for a job? Okay, and how many people are hiring? Okay. So take note. But that's, that's a fascinating stuff. Those of you who can't see this, there were about three times as many people hired as there were people looking for a job, which is absolutely fascinating. Uh, and what this is showing is there is no shortage of jobs out here, certainly in the startup world. The majority of all jobs in the US are coming from early stage startup kind of companies. The problem is matching the right kind of person to the right kind of job. Um, and that's a whole critical thing about what you do. Yeah, like I'm actually doing the closing um, presentation at TEDx Wall Street next week. Uh, and the, the theme there is redefining success. And we've been talking about how the success in this new world means you take charge of your own career. This is, this is very much the sort of view that Reed Hoffman's new book, where um, you know, you, your career is what you make it. And so whether it's a question of being engaged in the social conversation or improving your skills, classes here at General Assembly, it, it, once you get to be that kind of fit, there are lots of jobs that are open. So I'm just going to use that as an opportunity to talk about um, uh, the Jobs Act. We, we talked about it briefly before and uh, your opinions on, on crowdfunding and what startups, where, what startups, how they play a role in, in the economy at the moment. So this is going to sound a little schizophrenic, but there, there are really two sides to this story. On the one hand, obviously, I believe in the democratization of capital. And when you're looking at a world where companies are shrinking and shrinking, the day of the big company is gone. If you take a look at, at the size of companies that were in the sort of mid-20th century, they were enormous. You take a look at companies now, the biggest, most successful companies in the world, the Apples and the Googles and so on, they are shadows of, of, of what their predecessors were in the space. And that trend is only going to continue. So companies, they, I, one, another one of my uh, talks at Singularity U is called No More Companies, No More Jobs on the Way to a World Without Work. Um, because companies literally are disappearing. Whoa, so what does that mean? Um, it means that you're going to have to end up being an entrepreneur. And it means that as technology makes it possible to start with less and less and less, the average company starting here at General Assembly uh, is using a fraction, a minuscule fraction of the amount of capital that it would take to launch that same company 20 years ago. When I started my first techno, we got derailed along the way. I'm yeah, talking yeah. about my no, career. No. I mean, so I, I, I've had multiple careers. And, and so getting out of school, I actually started in politics. And uh, I majored, my major was in urban planning, and my minor was in the art of the book, the history of printing. Um, and so uh, being an urban planner, my first job out of college was working for Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan as his urban affairs expert. And I ended up running his regional office here uh, in New York. Um, and then uh, from there, I ended up going to real estate, the family firm, and spent a decade in real estate development. Um, and then on the side, I started a company, like many people here are starting companies. Uh, and so my first company, which was started out as a software company in New York City before there was anything called the internet, uh, eventually turned into 
an internet company. And that company ended up um, getting uh, venture capital. Um, a whole other so that was your that was your first that was your first time. No, that was actually well, it was, oh. was a back company number six alone and away somewhere. Um, that back then it was after, but then after real estate, I went actually after one hand, I went back into business school after Columbia, got an MBA in real estate finance. Then I started a business with my professor from Columbia. He actually started one of the, the world's first computer training companies called the Computer Classroom. Um, this is back in 1983. Or have you guys born? Um, and so we did training in VisiCalc and VisiCalc, and Lotus One Two Three, and word processing. And so that, that company is actually still going on now, although uh, I went years ago, and it's now technically a training operation. Um, so uh, that was one of my first after business school company. Um, and then uh, I saw. So, okay, I got it. Tell you how I got this started, other entrepreneurial stuff. Yeah, of so I have been online since 1979, way, way back. So like I had an Apple II computer before there was Apple II Plus, right? So like the very first thing coming out of the um, And I was a, you know, a, 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 a non-hacker hacker, right? I'm not really a techie, but I'm a technologist, so I understand this stuff, but I'm a real shitty coder. Um, so I, 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 I got an Apple II and I got playing with dabbling and I got online. Now you ask how the hell did you get online in like 19, you know, early 1980s? Um, and because there was no online. Well, there were these things called bullet board systems. And a bullet board system was actually, you would set up your computer with a modem and then you put up the phone number and other people with their computer would call your computer on a one-to-one -one basis. And it was like a store and forward, like a pop server. You know, you would, they would leave a message and then they would hang up and somebody else would call in and get the message and, and you would get a bulletin board going with that. So I, I had a bulletin board and, and uh, um, and then eventually the guys who had the big time sharing computers, um, which were being big computers big back then, now it's not an iPhone, uh, that were running these major corporations realized that their business was mostly during the day and they had these computers sitting idle in the middle of the night. Uh, and so there was uh, you know, one company that had all these computers and a very bright, bright guy said, hmm, you know, there are all these little people with these dial-up modems and these little strange things called personal computers. Uh, and if we actually to give those people access to dial into our big computer and use the power of this store of our big computer, there might be another revenue stream for them there. And so that's how the first sites like The Source and CompuServe uh, began to, to happen. So I was on CompuServe shortly after, back when Forbes called CompuServe, it was called IQNet. Um, and so I got online there and I participated in the, in the uh, Apple computer forums there. And it so happened that over time, all the people who were these early adopters in these forums they were the real hackers. They were starting these companies. So then, fast forward a little bit, 1984, the Mac, uh, you know, is released. Really cool. I became an assistant operator, assistant operator of the uh, Macintosh forums on, on CompuServe. Uh, got to know a lot of people and kind of a little gregarious. I became the not the assistant the sushi op of the micro network that we used group on, on CompuServe. And every year at the Mac World Trade Show, we run these these big sushi packets and stuff. But, but along the way, so I get to the first, you know, the first year there was a Mac World Show. I went there and it turned out that all these people who I had known online had these really cool companies, these little like 10 foot booths. Um, and that was really interesting. But the really cool thing was they got to go to special parties and I didn't get to go to because this is not my South by where there were parties. You know, back then there, there were parties for the people who attended these shows, but there were these, these sort of invitation only parties for the exhibitors. And my friends were the exhibitors, so I didn't get to go. So I said, hmm, problem, okay, what's the entrepreneurial solution? Well, clearly, you gotta be an exhibitor. So for the next Mac World Trade Show, it was in 1988, uh, I got a booth from the Mitchell Associates. I was running for uh, Just so you could go to the Just so I got a party. So, so, so now I got a booth as an exhibitor. Uh, one of my exhibitors. Oh, okay, quick, okay, I gotta backfill my booth. I gotta come up with a, with a, with a product um, at that point. So I was looking around at a um, at these remainder catalogs. They used to be, this is, again, now everything in overstock online is sold out within 30 seconds of uh, you know, being obsolete. But back then, there was enough of a lag time in technology development, so there were these catalogs of all these outmoded old electronic stuff. I saw in one of these catalogs a digital yes, wristwatch that actually had a serial port on it and had two pay of RAM and a two-line display screen on the watch itself. Um, and Sago had developed this thing in, in the mid-1980s. And, and Sago advertising, which I still have some of my files, um, showed a couple in bed with a wire connecting their two watches. You can exchange data with another, this is like 1986, <laughs> you know, talk about a benighted, ridiculous you know, thing. So, duh, and this thing sold for, I don't know, two, three, four hundred bucks, whatever it was. Suffice to say, they didn't sell me anything at all. 
Um, so they had dumped these things, and they were uh, sending them back to Japan to get the bulldozers. Um, and uh, so something ended up in the remainder catalog. And the catalog I saw, you know, had like nine units in it. So I finally got these nine units, and I figured, well, it's got a serial port, so how about we connect it to a Mac and we call the wrist Mac? So, uh, uh, also, I created the wrist Mac, which was a digital watch that connected to your Mac. And again, under the heading of, of, of pickup teams, I, so I knew, you know, my friend Nicholas Negroponte said that when the internet started, he knew every single person on the internet because it started at, you know, Harvard and Berkeley and so on. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't say I knew every person on the internet, but I knew a lot of people in this space. And so, I pulled together from the, the guy who created the HP 12C desktop calculator, Richard Reich, who was my coder, and um, a guy named uh, Neil Shapiro, who was a founding editor of Mac User Magazine, wrote the manual, and a guy named Dennis Brothers, who wrote the uh, H2X protocol for Mac transfer, did the design the cable to go to the Mac. So we had this sort of pickup little team, uh, and we created this product called the Risk Mac, and um, now you can actually download it from your Mac into your, into your watch. Um, and I took it, so now I can take it to you know, the Mac World Show, and I had a product called the Risk Mac in, the, in this booth. Uh, and we started showing people, and to my surprise, not to my surprise, people really thought this was very cool. Um, somebody in Apple was overheard the question of you know, saying, oh, no, the show is, is that lot, but what a cheesy salesman. Licensing, licenses, and so on and so forth. And uh, so actually, I happen to be oh, wearing it. Yes, so it's now 20, whatever it is, years later, 23 years later. And this is a original wrist mat over there. Um, so now I had a, so all of a sudden, so like here we are at Mac World, Fred Smith from, from FedEx, uh, you know, comes over and, and buys one, Bill Atkinson who wrote Mac Paint comes and buys one. So the next thing you know, I actually saw how to modify a hit um, in, this, in this product. And we were not so real estate business and doing everything else in there. So uh, I thought that was, that was pretty cool. Um, and so I, I went back to order more of these watches. Of course, they were from Maine. So I had to go to Seiko and get all the ones back in Japan and the was on on a boat, we get the cables, um, and it got to be a, 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 a whole big thing. Anyway, so okay, this actually leads up to the answer of it. Uh, so here I was with this, with this product, and, and uh, having gone through all of the, the, the uh, wrist max or the uh, Seiko watches, we had simple versions being built. Actually, I then got a call from NASA along the way, and, and NASA says, you know, we're, we're, we're flying a Mac portal way back in the early days on the space shuttle. Um, but the problem we have in the shuttle is that the astronauts really can't hear the enunciators because of the ambient noise in the spacecraft. Do you, you think maybe that this watch of yours could... Uh, <laughs> absolutely! Say no more! So, um, <laughs> so we created the, the space shuttle watch. Yes, the, the wrist mac. The, the, silver, the things we don't know. The, 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 the silver version of the wrist mac. Um, we'll give a little version for them. And, and so they actually um, would upload the, uh, the uh, schedules for the astronauts from Mission Control to the, to the Mac on, on board the space shuttle and download it into their watches. So now, of course, this was the space shuttle watch. So now, the next Mac World Trade Show, we had, you know, it's very politically correct now, but back then there were more boot babes. Um, so our, our, our boot babes back then were. Don't, don't worry about me. There's were, other people that would be very excited about it. Were, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they dressed in NASA jumpsuits and we gave out three fried ice cream and it was a, a very big, big cool thing. Yeah, as women should do. <laughs> yeah, so, so, yeah, I'm I, obviously kidding. Yeah, so, so, <laughs> so, yeah, so here we were. The only problem, pretty quickly, was this was selling out really fast and really obviously a limited number of these things. So I, I go back to, to Seiko and say, okay, well, yeah, but you're actually selling these things. And, we got distribution of all the catalogs and stuff, so it's still my hobby, my spare time. Um, but you know, we have to do a new one. Can you can you do one with like more RAM and give you a screen and whatever? And they said, sure, we're happy to design it for you. You know, two one costs about three million dollars. I said, okay, that's not gonna work. Um, so that would seem to be the end of um, the risk Mac product. And so, but anyway, so here we are selling this thing, and I had to come up with it with a name for the company. So uh, you know, um, and I, it came as a bit of a surprise. So I only had a very short period of time. And back then I was thinking of things like, you know, it's, as you would imagine, easy to spell, easy to pronounce, like Lion software, whatever it is. And all the trademarks were taken, this is even before URLs. Um, so I, I finally decided as, as, a, as a who um, to incorporate it as XMAC, E-X space M-A-C-H-I-N-A, which you know, was a sort of multiple, multilingual pun and several variants of the use X Machina, the implied basis of me, X Machina out of the Mac, out of the machine, formerly Mac, you know, all kinds of really cool things. And so I thought that was a pretty good name. You know, and our, our business cards actually showed the Donald Trump's you know, hand with the big blue and the card. The only problem was, um, you ever try and give somebody a card that says X Machina? X Machina? So I thought, 
So what the, where did that name come What does that mean? So I actually had to... Uh, didn't read a lot of... You know, uh, well, when we're back in the car, I actually had to put a paragraph explaining where the name came from. <laughs> that was not my, one of my, my greatest ideas. But in any event, so here we were um, with this uh, you know, interesting product, and I couldn't do any more for Seiko, you know, with Seiko. Um, but there was clearly a something to be had in here. And that's when Motorola introduced the wristwatch pager, the first of the, of the really portable wristwatch pagers. Um, and so uh, we said, okay, cool, we'll figure out how to get into um, uh, paging companies using like a dispatch protocol that operator or dispatch centers use. Um, and we can send it to them, we'll private label the Motorola wristwatch pager, and it'll be the wireless wristwatch. Um, and so we figured out how to do that. And then we realized the Motorola pager, wristwatch pager, really sucked. It was like the size of a, of a saucer plate, and nobody in their right mind would be caught dead wearing this thing. Besides, it was actually a numeric pager, which didn't, you know, getting numbers didn't really help you. But then Motorola introduced the first text pager. This is the predecessor of um, text messaging, you know, something messaging in smartphone. Back then, it was a text, uh, a text pager. And we said, OK, so how about if you use this software to send a message to a text pager? Uh, and we did that, and we figured out how to do it, and we created a software um, server product. So I said, well, we're doing this, APIs. We had fans of APIs back in like, 1991 or thereabouts. Um, you know, we'll, we'll let other programs um, send messages to your pager, because that was just when the very first inter-application communications programs, uh, it's, um, Windows 3.1 and System 7 on the Mac, and, uh, uh, you know, something like Data Data Exchange, Apple events. So we created a server application that would let, you, let other programs send our program message saying, send this to a pager over there, a wireless device, and so now any program can be wireless. That sounded pretty cool. So our product is called Notify. Um, it's going the name X Magna. Uh, and uh, we, you know, sent it, we, we put this out, we took a couple of ads out, it seemed to do pretty well. People seem to have liked being able to type a message in their computer to a pager. So then I made a mistake. Then I said, okay, well, we have this toolkit with this API. Nobody ever heard of an API back then. We have enough now. Back then, um, But we, we, we you know, go up to Dr. Gobbs Journal and these, these heavy-duty coder mags and say, here's this, this thing. You know, you know, in three lines of code, we'll make your application wireless and you can send it to your alarm clock or your pilot and stuff. Um, so we, we, we put it out there and we, and we so we put like a 30,000 person mail on this. And typically, you'll get you know a couple of percent of this thing. Um, we ended up getting um, 4,000 responses. Um, people who wanted to, they, they, yeah, this was me and my real estate secretary in the you know so no way I couldn't open 4,000 you know envelopes over there. So that was a bit of an over or overreach. Um, however, at this point, we now were in the paging software business, and uh, so um, the, the, the next thing I know, uh, I get a call from, uh, well, actually, I'm a joiner, right? So I, I join everything. Uh, and there was a paging trade association for paging companies. So I said, all right, well, I've got my paging company, but we're a, a pager associate, so I joined the, um, what was then called Telocator, which was the paging industry trade association down in D.C. And I joined, and, and the next thing I, I'm going to get a call from them saying, uh, oh, well, you're, you're a technical person, so we put you on the Patient Technical Committee. So, okay, that's fine. So I, I go down to my first meeting on the Patient Technical Committee uh, for the Telecator Software Association, uh, 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 Patient Trade Association, and I find myself walking into a fight between Motorola and a company called Glenair. Now, Motorola owned the entire pager market. They had like an 80, 90% share of all pagers, and Glenair owned the the paging system market, the, thing the paging carriers have to send the messages, the paging terminal send the messages out of these things. Um, and the question was, well, okay, they want to do a, a new data page that will let you send data over these paging networks, wireless networks. And they dis and Motorola and Leonard couldn't agree on what the um, spec should look like. And so the rest of the people on this committee turned out to be wireless, you know, RF paging antenna people that didn't look on the computer, bit in the nose. Um, and so the question is, what do you do? Well, you know, I just read this out ahead of the committee meeting, so I actually had an opinion, so I said, well, oh, I think. And they said, well, okay, you're so smart, you write the protocol. So that's how I ended up as the editor of the Paging Industries Data Protocols for um, Wireless Data Messaging, a committee consisting of Motorola, Glen Air, and me as the editor and moderator of this, this thing, which was a you know, very interesting situation. So of course, being a quick study, I then had to quickly read up on how the hell to write this and protocol and so on, which was very, very interesting and we got on some stuff. So I basically spent the next year and a half, you know, pro bono, trying to figure out how to, how to write um, uh, the protocols, which was fascinating. Anyway, along the way then, 
Well, I kind of well, I, just just for interest of time, because I think you know we could really. I know you have a million stories. I kind of want to. I want to fast forward to New York Angels and and how you got started with. Oh, with, so I got to jump like six companies and all kinds of fascinating <laughs> ways. Suffice to say. I'd love to have we come back to another time and so, we can get into all. Of this. No, we're happy to. But okay. so, so all right. So here's so let's so, 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 so make a long story short. I got to take a quick story and then I'll come back to that. It, it's the floor is yours. And, and so, so, so here I was with this this paging software company, um, and uh, this is really cool. This was like the first mobile kind of mobile industry, mobile software, mobile phones, mobile smartphones. Think back in the the caveman. Think Fred Flintstone, right? I mean, there was nothing. So we were the past for the entire. It was really very cool because as far as so here we were with the software application, the whole fancy schmancy API and so on. The uh, application back in, in Windows apps send messages to mobile devices. The only mobile device was a pager back then. Um, and so as far as the, the computer industry was concerned, you know, mobile, oh wow, like I think I'm carrying my thing here. So we got credit from the computer industry for being the owners of the entire access to the mobile world. And the mobile world, which had all these guys who did pages and radio stuff, didn't know them from computers at all. So we got credit for them for being the entry to the entire computer world. So here we were, this little teeny five-person company sitting here in the middle of these to the behemoth uh, industries, which was, was really fascinating. Um, so uh, the next thing I know, I, I get a call from a guy named David Corsi, uh, who back then was the editor of a uh, newsletter, saying they were starting a new um, event called Demo, which would be a introduction <coughs> demonstration event um, for new technology. And, and they were picking the best software products of the year, and they had found us. Um, this notified product, and, and we were the best product software, one of the 75 best products of the year, would we like to come out and demonstrate? So I said, sounds good to me. Um, where California? Where's California anyway? So I'm mean, being in New York. So I go out to California to, to the, the first demo, and back then, at, at, for those of you who've been to demos now, sort of a very organized thing with the stuff. Back then, they gave you like a desk and a chair and a guest chair and a potted plant, and you would sort of sit there and demo your stuff to people who would come around. So I'm sitting there demoing our, our, our paging, you know, wire messaging thing, and people like, you know, John Doerr and Esther Dyson come around, uh, and, uh, you know, they ask, you know, very, very interesting, and, you know, what a very cool thing, you know, so, uh, you know, how much are you looking for? <laughs> how much what am I looking for? What they looked at me like I had three heads and said, how much money are you looking for? <laughs> I said, oh, um, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> <laughs> I had like that problem. I, I, didn't, I didn't know, but I didn't know there was anybody who would, who would, you know. Anyway, so suffice to say, um, to a, a very, very long story, um, we ended up uh, um, getting falling backwards into venture capital without, and raising venture capital without even asking for venture capital, which like never, ever, ever, ever happens. Um, and I, I didn't know venture capital existed before I even got that. Uh, so we actually got, got funded at that point by Warder Pinkett, the world's largest venture capital fund, um, who said that their goal is to see if they could turn a phenomenon into a company. Um, so I said, okay, we'll give it a shot. So, so they, they invested in us, and, and so we're, we're off the races. And then, that's, so all of a sudden we started growing, and we became the largest developer of wired messaging software, and you know, clients like Nextel, and Skype, and all these, all these big guys. Um, and then, but you know, being farsighted, doctrinal, visionary type of thing, you know, um, there's this thing called the internet, bum 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 bum. You see this little shark man coming, right? You know, and so we were in the dial-up software business. You could use, you know, sort of thing and dial in and send a message, um, which wasn't going to work. So uh, clearly, the whole dial-up world would disappear. So what do you do if you're a software company specializing in the wireless space? So we said, okay, is there a way that we can actually use this internet thingy that's coming out and this wireless thingy that we already got and knock it all together and do a wireless internet kind of thing? Um, and so the answer was, yeah, there was. And we actually, um, Motorola at that point designed a, a chipset that would let you do wireless um, you know, in a chip instead of a picture. So we actually created the first wireless data receiver for um, computer controlled the news capture. Um, and, uh, you would plug into your computer, be a serial port, and we could broadcast that stuff wirelessly over patient frequencies and have it come into your computer. Uh, and we showed people on the NDA what we were doing, and people started loving this, and it was really, really very, very cool. Um, and so we all of a sudden, venture capital money started pouring into this thing, uh, and we ended up having all kinds of people coming in. We employed a village, and, we, and then the next thing, we've got uh, uh, 
Symantec ended up in a piece of us, and this thing launched, and it was an enormously big critical success. Well, Mossberg did a whole full-page column in the journal about this, and we won the Cody Award. We actually came second for the Cody Best Software Product in a year. It went to Internet Explorer. Microsoft actually changed IE4 so we could beat it and stuff wirelessly in there. We licensed this to folks like Compaq and NEC and uh, Village and Philips and all kinds of cool play. HP did a version of it with their sort of drug design kind of thing. And it shipped, um, and there was only one slight problem. Nobody bought it, which is very impressive. I mean, here was this clearly certifiable genius product, wonderful system. I mean, we had a whole network operation center with 24 7 people. We were taking data and news feeds from you know, everybody in the world and broadcasting after your computer with a war winning interface. And the, you know, sometimes stuff just doesn't work. Um, so what would you give advice? What advice would you give to your former self, knowing what you know now? Well, you know, so that, so what did I take out of that? Well, so so the, the, well, here we were, we were betting on paging as a, as a you know, the delivery mechanism. We designed our own hardware um, for this device, which was problematic. We then, we were actually creating an entirely new category called a wireless data receiver, what the hell that is, nobody knew. And then on top of that, we were building a brand called the Air Media, Air Media Live Internet Broadcast Network. And so doing all those things simultaneously, um, it just it did not work. We ended up going through probably $40, $50 million in venture capital for this thing. We ended up with a whole warehouse full of stuff that nobody bought. Everybody loved it, everybody thought it was wonderful, and nobody bought the product. And so when I had all these PCs in the company at that point, um, and so I said, oops, guys, we seem to have the problem. Uh, and so um, we, uh, at that point, had um, a bunch of really good VCs. This is the net level lesson here is pick your investors carefully. So we had supporters like this. Um, was a great investor. We had I mean, Row uh, was in it. Uh, Row Capital, great investors. Um, we had what makes a great investor? People who are integrity. I, I would say I'm on record as saying this: investors and entrepreneurs. Integrity is the number one critical piece. Absolutely vital. If you don't have integrity, if you have integrity, you can weather any kind of storm. If you're a scuzzball, you know, bad stuff happens. And ultimately, it's going to happen to you even if you take advantage of somebody else along the way. So in this particular case, I had a whole bunch of, of really good stand-up VCs. Um, and I had one VC who was a real scuzzball. I'm not going into names, but bad, bad people. Why? Well, let's put it this way. Um, when we were in really dire shape, um, we needed cash to make payroll. Um, I, I said that uh, you know, hey, I'm, I'm prepared to, to to put the money um, into the company just as, as, a, as a loan, no interest loan, you know, myself to cover to cover payroll. Um, but because that might actually prevent us from going into bankruptcy, um, the DC rep on the board got all the board conference calls so we wouldn't have a quorum to vote to accept my free money into the company because they didn't want to let the company get so. That's pretty bad, as this bad stuff goes. So anyway, this is the same. We've got to the point where, where you know, uh, I had another idea. That's what entrepreneurs have, right? So we had this whole network operations center and so on. So I would go to my investors and say, OK, tell you what, if you take our whole network operations center and all the stuff we know about wireless, and how about we change around and create a whole hub for the whole wireless industry? Um, what do you think? And there were sort of three reactions. Um, one, one group um, said, you know, straight up guys. You know, we like you, it's a very interesting idea, but you know what, I think this hand is it out, so we'll, you know, do whatever you have to do, we'll, we'll take our, our hit, we want to recapitalize, but that's fine, but, uh, you know, thanks, but no thanks for us. That's perfectly good. Okay. And I had one major investor who said, we got a lot of money in this thing, and we think you might be onto something here, and we're going to have a you know, back you know, so, okay, take a very deep breath, we'll put some cash in to refund the restart over here if you come in, you know, with us to, to do this. So I said, okay, that sounds really cool. Then I had this one other firm, and this other fund said, we want to be pay out the full. I said, we pay out the full, we just, you know, they just took a 95%, you know, cram down on, on this thing. Um, and they said, no. So he said, okay, no. And they were the smallest investor in the operation. Um, and so I, I said, well, look at the cap table, look at the, the capital table of the company. The last cash that went in went in as a secure note for me personally and um, the other major VC. Um, and so if, if you force the company into bankruptcy, you're going to get wiped out and you're going to give me the company. Is that really what, does that make any sense to you? No, 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 no. So, so, so you know, trying to play the player. We know you, you know, you, you know, too much reputation. You won't declare bankruptcy. You won't file. I said, if you're forcing me to do this, is that what you're going to do? So they played chicken. 
and you know, you don't, if somebody plays chicken with you and tries to do bad things, you know, life is too short um, to, to screw around. So I said, if that's what you want to do, if you want to force us into Chapter 11, you do it. So they did, and we went into Chapter 11, and that was probably, up until that point, the saddest day of my life. I mean, I literally cried myself to sleep. You know, filing for bankruptcy is not fun. Not fun at all. Um, so what happened there was, surprise, surprise, they got wiped. Um, and the company ended up uh, being, the new company, funded by Citigroup, ended up being me and Citigroup owning the whole company. And we put the other straight VCs who had, you know, minor positions in the company and, and uh, uh, their original capital. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the first guys, you know, the other guys got wiped. Right. So what happened? Well, if you do the timing on all this, it turns out that this happened in about 1998. Um, and that was not a bad time to be in the internet business. Uh, and so happened, we actually started filing patents um, on all the stuff for the Airbnb Live Broadcast Network when we first thought of it, like four years before. And um, within about three months of the time we came out of Chapter 11, the patents issued. Oh, wow! And the patents issued a really cool thing for wireless stuff in the whole boom world. And next thing you know, we had a appraisal on our, on our IP portfolio of $120 million. Okay, within four months of coming out of Chapter 11 Magazine, we get around a $60 million venture around $120 million pre-valuation. Folks, those were the times. That ain't happening anytime soon. That was a living history, but it was a lot of fun to be in the middle of that living history. Um, so, uh, so there we were. But anyway, so I, in the old days, I was 122 people from the company. We ended up after the Chapter 11 getting we were crashed down to my core team of like 15 people. Um, then with the new, new funding everything, we came back up again. We were 75. We were, you know, we were running the, the hub. Wireless hub for the whole world of wireless. Um, I acquired a company in the UK, which got me into the of Richard Branson. We ended up having uh, operations in Germany and in France and in the US and in, and in England. Um, and we were taking over the world. And at that point, um, we were heading to Yoga, we had some in Korea, we licensed our stuff to Korea, we were heading into Europe, um, and it was really perfect. And so, what do I know about running a mega one international tech and whatever it was? So I, I went out to try and find you know, a CEO for this operation. And I recruited the number three guy out of IBM, who was this brilliant, you know, 17 year life at IBM, who run their uh, Unix division and their, in their mobile computing division. So he basically leaves his whole career at IBM, comes in and takes on the CEO, we do a three month uh, transition, and finally, for the first time in 13 years, I get to take a vacation. The, the, Where did you go? I went back home <laughs> to see my kids. Um, but the, the, uh, the, the next thing you know, of course, if you are following the timeline over here, dum 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 is the other big mega shark coming in the other direction. You know, that ate the, the internet shark over here. Um, and so that was uh, the bad times, as we call them, uh, in uh, the year 2000. And the whole world blows up effectively overnight. Uh, and the internet world crashes, the mobile world crashes, domestically and internationally, everything that we were in the middle of doing with our wonderful new business plan it wasn't based on any one particular entity, but this one wasn't based on particular hardware, it wasn't based on a particular content. It was I did everything perfectly right, except it was the wrong time. Uh, so at that point, um, we actually had, uh, you know, so we had closer operations in the US, we had some traction in, in Europe, uh, we had an offer from a public company in uh, Germany to acquire the assets, I came in uh, for my sabbatical and some signed papers on September 11th, 2001. <coughs> World Trade Center goes down, the capital markets closed, and that is the end of that particular company. So um, this time, with no chance of coming anything happening in the world, this was actually a chapter seven. And for those of you who don't know, the intricacies of the chapter the number running over here, chapter 11 is when you can actually restart and your creditors work with you when you've actually reformed the company. Chapter seven <coughs> is you basically pack it up and go home. So this was chapter seven this time. Believing the second bankruptcy hurts a whole lot, but not quite as bad as the first bankruptcy over there. Uh, so um, at that point, um, I go home and my wife says, okay, you're grounded. <laughs> I want to ask you a question about all this. So how much of the experience it, during this experience, how much did you learn on that? Because I think part of being an entrepreneur is that there's so much to learn. And I, how many other people would agree with that? In terms of, do you feel like you're learning something new every day? I, I do. And uh, how much did you... I mean, entrepreneurship is it's like a shark in the water, you know, swim forward or die. I mean, you, you have to get the water flowing over the gills. You have to get new, new things. That comes back to managing your life, your career, and it's a constant period of learning. That's one of the great things about General Assembly here is all these courses that you can take in every, every area. And so you know, a lot of it is, you know, back then there wasn't a General Assembly, but there weren't these courses. 
So a lot of it was learned by doing and learned by mistakes. And you know, if you're not making mistakes, there's a real problem. You shouldn't certainly shouldn't be an entrepreneur, and you're probably you know living life the wrong way. Because the only way you effectively really learn is by mistakes. Just never make the same mistake twice, which of course occurred, which makes a lot of sense, right? But so every mistake you learn from, and I certainly did several times over, but after the second, um, <coughs> uh, you know, during the, the bad period, as we say, and I was grounded, um, so I, I was no longer allowed to start a company as an entrepreneur, so I had to get kids in college, and I just needed to twiddle my thumbs, and uh, so, so back then, you know, back in the boom days, um, I, there was a site that started uh, in New York, um, and it was a new thing called social networking, whatever that thing was. And, and it was a site called Six Degrees. How many here remember a site called Six Degrees? Anybody? A few of you, right? So this was the very first social networking site. Um, and I thought it was the coolest thing I had ever seen. Because I let you, you know, you would sign up and then you would put in like your barber or your brother or whatever it is, and they they connect people, and you could actually walk through the chain and connect to all these people. And now the only person I know who did that is my mother, who remembers everybody she's ever met in her entire life. And can't you walk in here today and connect all with each other? But I thought this was, after her, the greatest thing I'd ever seen. And it was headquartered in New York. So one day, I just, during the boom, I just walked into their office and kind of picked up my grocery and said, I want to meet the CEO of this really cool company. And, and there I meet this, like, this kid. It's like this, you know, this, this young whipper snapper. I mean, Andrew Weinrich, who had actually invented social networking. And patented social networking, by the way. So anyway, Andrew and I were friends. Andrew had better luck than I did. He sold for $135 million, um, uh, you know, six degrees. Um, unfortunately, he sold it in, I think, 2000. And three months after he sold the company to the public company, um, they shut the site down. And three months after that, the public company disappeared. So, you know, Andrew had now, um, you know, made a fortune quickly, lost the fortune. He's back on the street. But he's been an entrepreneur, too. So um, I was signed on. He came to me and he said, um, so uh, I've got this idea for a wireless kind of thing. You're a wireless guy. So I said, well, I can't start a company. I can't go back. I might go away. So we said, well, how about can you be an investor? So I said, okay, fine. So, I, so that's how I became my first angel deal. I invested in this company, I became my shareholder of the business plan. Um, we helped get born Nicholas Necropathy. We helped get finance. This was called Joltage, which was um, the, the first distributed Wi Fi hotspot network. Really very cool home of the business plan. But in any event, so that was my first angel investment. Um, and uh, so I, that's how I became an angel investor. And then, of course, being a joiner, I tend to join whatever. And, well, back in the, in, the, in the good days, I had actually been one of the co-founders of the New York Media Association, NIMMA, which was sort of the predecessor of New York Tech Media way back then. Um, and along the way, in the late 90s, um, NIMMA had created something called the Angel Investor Program, where people who had made it in the first round, you know, folks like Scott Kern, Nestor Dyson, Alan Patrick, um, would come in and hear pictures from people. And so, uh, now that I was officially an angel investor, I was an thing, uh, I joined um, this uh, NIMMA's Angel Program. Um, and then the next thing you know, they, they were doing the NIMA itself was doing super cyber stuff and these big parties and stuff in the go-go days. All of a sudden, the bad days come and you now have 8,000 members of NIMA all unemployed looking for jobs from the other 8,000 people. And that did not make for a very good business model for trade association. So NIMA went bankrupt. Um, and the only thing that was actually functioning there was the Angel Program. Um, and the, it was acquired by, by SIA, the Software Information Association, that does the code awards. Um, and so, but SIA, you know, didn't really, it didn't make sense for them to have an angel group uh, for this DC-based trade association. So I said, okay, how about we spin that? So, so that's what we spun out the, the original people who were actually writing checks for this group and created the New York Angels. This is now like 2004. Uh, and so, you know, since I had nothing else to do, I actually spent all my time creating an angel group. And we wrote the bylaws and figured out best practices. And, and we were the first members of the Angel Capital Association. Um, and we got people, you know, to come around and, you know, to join this thing. And we tripled the dues and, and put in requirements for investing mm -hmm. and developed a really functional angel group. Uh, Let me ask you a question about that because a lot of people are in this room are talking to angels. And in fact, I was having a conversation with someone last night about investors that are potentially investing in her company and, and they've never made an investment before. So to founders, what kind of advice would you give them about vetting angels, working with angels, and and if they and working with investors who have never gotten into any of this before? The first the first piece of advice is a little reality testing. This is one of the things that comes with, with age and comes with experience. A lot of life is just pattern matching, right? Um, and that is, you see, all these things about you pick your investors very carefully. And so, so. First, you've got to have investors to pick from. The odds of getting an investor, any kind of investor, good, bad, ugly, and different, whatever it is, is like teeny, teeny, teeny. The, the number of, of, of companies that get invested in by venture capitalists, one in 400. 
That means there are 399 <coughs> companies who have tried to get venture finance for every one who gets it. Now, we live in this bizarre blogosphere, echo chamber world. You said, hang out here at General Assembly, and you read TechCrunch, and, and uh, whatever. And it seems that everybody on, on every street corner is, oh, you know, Dennis Crowley, you know, I'm kind of running around getting, oh, because so and so raised 40 million dollars for color, or mm, so on and so forth, right? You know, those are the, by far, outliers. Real people in the real world don't really get venture capital. I mean, it's, it's one in 400. Now, angels are a little more promiscuous, and there are a lot more of them, and they invest a lot lower number, but still, for angel investing, it's one in 40. Right? So still, you know, 39 to 1 against your odds of getting angel funding. So the very first thing to realize is have a little reality test in here. It's not going up a lot. A, if you don't get it, it's not because you're an idiot and, and awful and bad, and everybody else except for you is getting it. They're not either. You're living in a very interesting, internecine little echo chamber here, right? So A is very tough. So before you say, I'm going to be so picky, get someone to pick from first. Okay. That being said, if you are lucky as enough to have people who are willing to invest in you, then, and, and by the way, if you have a company, and the only way you will have a company going forward is if you take outside investment, you know, you have to make a choice, um, you know, do I take investment or do I not have a company? And so if Fields of Love walks up or, you know, you know if the investment button comes in, you may be saying, hey, life is too short and I'll shut the company down rather than, than take this tank of money, right? On the other hand, if it's like dumb money or it's money that in fact you get a hard time, and that's why one of my uncles said, um, you know, a great deal, you know, buys a lot of aspirin. Uh, so it can be an obnoxious person, but if he's actually legit, you might want to look at that if you're on the choice to shut the company down. But let's say that you actually have a choice of multiple investors, angels, VCs, whatever to choose from. You know, you go with integrity and you go with reputation and you go with smarts every day of the week. And having and I've now at this point had you know a good dozen or more VCs. In me, and I, and I know every angel in, in New York, um, and most of them in, in the majors of the country. And I will tell you that quality tells, and the, and the, the quality and the, and the good things that a smart, high integrity, you know, smart money brings is estimately worth more than pure cash. What are the key questions that a founder can ask an angel in order to better qualify that? I mean, I speak to some of your portfolio companies. Very simple, reference check. They're reference checking you. They're looking at your business plan. So assuming you have a choice, right? And but even if you don't, you see how many other day guys are actually asking you, right? So any angel who will not tell you in which companies they've invested, who will not put you in touch with their portfolio CEOs, run, do not walk. You know, and so this is a very interesting transparency thing over there. I am constantly flabbergasted by investors who play everything close to us. Oh, well, 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 I can't tell you who my what kind of limited partners I have, or I can't, you know, they won't take all their LPs, but they should be able to give you a, a deal for it. Companies which they've invested, you know, they should be able to put you in touch with their CEOs and say, call any of you want and ask what they think. And then you call them and you ask. And, and CEO to CEO, they'll often be pretty cool about giving you a straight answer over there. And I've done it for good CEOs, good investors, and not so good investors. And some of my, my good friends in the space, people who I've warned off of, like really dead guys, right? Because that can hurt you in the so do the reference checking on them, and then try and make sure that, that they're, what they're doing matches what you're doing. So if you have somebody who only invests in biotech and you're a social network, you know, you really got to wonder, can they add a lot of value to me? Are they going to be helpful when things go wrong? We had one investor at Rick Angels um, who was uh, coming out of the corporate world and was, was a really big shot success in the corporate world and had run corporate M&A portfolios and stuff. And all of a sudden, Gus gets into the uh, startup world and invested very, you know, big money into the deal. And, sitting here and, and the mindset is completely different. Understanding the pivots and understanding the challenges of a startup is really different. So, so smart money with experience, a good track record, high integrity, all for it. We're gonna, I want to ask you one more question because I definitely want to get to, to Gus and then I want to open the questions to the room because we're already running on an hour. So um, tell us a little bit about Gus and why, and I think this is actually the way people can hit Pitch their right. companies to you is by creating profile. So, right. so, here I, so here I am, picking up our story with Leslie Leather Hero. Yeah. Um, uh, New York Angels, um, and uh, I mean, it's a couple of years, and you know, Josh Koppelman and Howard Morgan, by the way, the founders of First Founder Capital, were both New York Angels board members as, as individual angels. And you know, one day Josh pulls me aside and says, um, you know, 
I mean, I don't understand that. You're a little overqualified to be running an angel group, but I said I'm not allowed to do anything else. Um, so eventually, after having a couple of years of the year around the house, my wife said, I'll fight, I'll fight, go start a company. Um, and at that point, understanding where this world was going, being very familiar now with the angel world, having invested, I've now invested in over 80 companies. And having seen thousands of companies come through and having been on both sides of the issue, it was very, very clear that technology changed for meaning you could start companies with a whole lot less than the traditional VCs. So my first the Air Media number one took 20 million bucks in VC to get to internet production. After the second, after the restart, Air Media two only took two million bucks to get to internet, to internet production. When I invested in, in, uh, in Andrew and, and, and the Eldridge, only took 200,000 bucks to get to the internet production. New York Angels a couple of years ago invested in a company called Palm 5, which is now the largest uh, stock media footage marketplace in, in online. Um, they came to us with a full management team, full uh, uh, product, generating revenue, total dollars invested to the road check, $20,000. $20 million, $2 million, 200000 20000 Straight line, you're looking here at an extraordinarily you know, um, exponential change in the cost. And so looking at that, it was clear that with lowering costs of starting a company, it makes it available to more and more people to fund it. You don't need to go to Warburg Pickus anymore and raise 20 million bucks. You can actually go to individual people and put in 20,000 bucks or 50,000 bucks in a good deal. And therefore, with this stuff happening, communications, globalization, online platforms, SaaS, all these things, and running New York Angels, it was clear to me that there was a potentially big future here. And there was a big prize to be had if somebody would be able to have the sit splice, as we say, the ability just to sit and wait and patiently play out a hand for a long period of time to create an infrastructure for this whole platform, for this whole world of, of new world of angel investing and startup leading, leading startups and so on. And so that's what the idea was behind Gut. Now it turns out, not an original idea, there have been by my count about 150 um, different sites that